Welcome to Talking Giants presented by SeatGeek. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. And we've got ourselves a Dan Duggan interview, which is about 40 minutes. And we figured after three days, Justin, actually four days, for, for all Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, we'd be on here talking about some signings. No signings, just departures since our last episode. How are you? No signings. Uh, kind of thank you, Giants. Thank you for allowing us to <laughs> have a weekend. But, hey... It's Monday. It's Tuesday. Let's let's get rocking and rolling again. I uh, got the feeling last week. It's like, oh, we got some additions. We got the, some additions. It was nice. So uh, let's let's get some more, even if they're tiny guys. Um, a. Sean Robinson's a big guy, though. He could be coming. Yeah, I have a film breakdown ready to publish. This is like Kenny Galladay level of preparation for A. Sean Robinson. <laughs> uh, Justin, before we uh, talk about the losses of Feliciano and Julian Love, uh, this episode was brought to you by Ethan Taub. Dan Walsh, Bill Walsh's son, Mike Lynch, John Lynch's son, a lot of 49ers like people wow. in, in here today. Just William. That's actually my uh, my nephew. I have a nephew now. His, na- his name is William. Mm. And then John Marciano, Rocky Marciano's son. Justin, who are these people? Does your nephew call you poop face? Nope. He doesn't talk yet. Nope. Doesn't talk yet. It's a um, month and a half old. Mm. I am buying him some NASCAR cars, though. Good for you. He might eat them. I'll uh, save that for another video. But anyways. Patreon.com slash Talking Giants. Uh, these 49er fans and John Feliciano. That's where they went. Patreon.com slash Talking Giants. $2 a month plus some other tiers. Hang out with us live while we record the shows. And you can chat with us. We have pre-show chats. We have post-show chats. Bobby Skinner will send you some stickers in the mail. Plus, there's an opportunity to win some merch twice a month. Uh, Bobby and I, we talked today about uh, the concept for our draft hoodie. So that yeah, is in the process. Yeah, draft hoodies are in production. So in get production. Ready. Get excited. Patreon.com slash Talking Giants. Thanks to our patrons. I'm wearing last year's draft hoodie. I think you're wearing the year before's draft I'm hoodie. I'm wearing, yeah. Th- so this is my favorite hoodie. The What was this, 2021 this, yeah. this was? Talking that, that's Giants. probably our best hoodie we have is 2021. Yeah. Talking Giants versus the world on the back, simple font, and then, you know, the to- the updated Talking Giants logo on the front. This is my I favorite like hoodie. this one. Like, I like the like the champion logo of Talking Giants, but the culture of, and I love culture of violence on the back. Yeah. But I also did wear it out today. Me and my brother went and got lunch, and he's yeah. like, nice hoodie, dude, just walking around with a hoodie that <laughs> in giant fonts is culture of violence. Um. Julian Love signed with the Seahawks, two years, $12 million. Uh, So the writing was on the wall when the Giants didn't have anything done at the start of free agency with Julian Love. And then they started making signings, you know, guys like Paris Campbell, Bobby O'Karake, obviously you you bring in Darren Waller and it's like, okay, the money is is running dry. Julian Love got two years, $12 million, though, which is about the range that we said would be fair for him and would want him back on. So it does stink that we don't have him back. Safety now becomes a pretty big need. I know they want to trust with Belton and, and they like Pinnock, but safety still is a, is a need. There's a lot of needs on this Giants team. Uh, and it does suck to lose a homegrown guy that you wish you could have kept. By the way, remember when... It was so outrageous that I said that Julian Love may get more money than Jordan Poyer. I think Jordan Poyer only got five hundred thousand more dollars um, than Julian Love. Still more. Still more. Um, you acted like it was outrageous, though. Um, it is outrageous, and even though it was close, it was I was still right. I was almost right, and that's the that's the name of this podcast. Bobby's right, and then Justin was almost right. Um, yeah, yeah, man. I, I don't think safety. You just said it's a big. I don't think it's a huge need. I just think it's. I just think depth needs to be rounded out. I like Pinnock. Um, you drafted Belton. I, I know we kind of have a little bit of differing of opinions. I'm kind of tough. I'm tough on Belton for like no reason, kind of because I didn't love the draft pick to begin with, but because he was drafted in the fourth round, I kind of do expect him, especially in a system where you already have Xavier McKinney. I expect Dane Belton to be a number two safety at some point within the next one to two years. So uh, I think Pinnock can kind of step up and be versatile. I think he could play deep and Pinnock can play in the box a little bit. Pinnock is still relatively new to the position. He played a corner. Um, What was this? this, His second kind of full ish year at safety, Bobby, Jason Pinnock. Yeah. Yeah, He's uh, moved around in both with the jets and the giants quite a bit. 
So I'm excited to see him to see him grow um, with with the Giants, but certainly they need depth. The Giants need depth at the safety spot for sure. Yeah, and and, and Love was a solid player, but kind of he was wanting ten like almost ten million dollars a year, like around that number at the at the bye week when they were talking about negotiating and, and things were seeming like they're going to get done, which obviously he wasn't going to get. And there is a rumor that. He, he was offered more by the Giants originally, but when he didn't take that, the Giants kind of moved on. Which you've seen that happen with other players too, like Dalton Schultz, C.J. Gardner Johnson. Um, you know, kind of playing their cards wrong and and being stuck, not getting the contract they want. So that's happened suck. with a lot of players. I feel like this off season, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This free agency has been like the end. The NFL owners are loving the way this free agency went. Um. With Julian Love, he was always a solid player for the Giants. I don't think he was at ever any point like a really, really good player. He had some good moments, obviously, really good moments. Um, you know, we talked about it. I went over my PPP notes on him uh, a couple weeks ago, and the guy literally played different a different position the majority of the time every single year, where there was one year, 2020 cornerback was the position he ended up playing the most. Like they were, they were, he was starting games at outside corner in 2020, 2019 playing the box, playing a little more free, uh, in 2021. And then this year, you know, playing both free and box, but just as a first time as a, as a in a full time role for the whole season. So was a guy you could always rely on. Like he wasn't a huge difference maker. So like, I, I'm not like, I'm not weeping at his loss, you know, but like, losing Darius Slayton would have been more painful than losing Julian Love. Uh, so it sucks to lose him. Wish we could have kept him. He's, he's He falls into the once a giant, always a giant guy. A oh, su- yeah. The second most successful day two draft pick of Dave Gettleman's era, uh, only to Darius Slayton. Yeah, yeah, I agree for sure. Um, and with a pretty high, like high prospect out of Notre Dame, like that was one of my favorite picks of the 2019. Like we really liked Julian Love going into it. Yeah, that was a really um, good value pick, like f- from the start. Oh yeah, I thought Julian Love was going to be like top of the third round guy. Then obviously we weren't as um, as polished in our draft stuff then, but like like he he led the end uh, college football in passes def- uh, deflected his senior year. Like he was a really good corner at Notre Dame. They move him yeah. to safety and then kind. Of, was, he was finally going to play free safety. They finally benched Antoine Bethea, and then Jabril Peppers goes down. And he moves into the box, and I felt like that kind of that told the story of his career as a Giant. Like came in as a corner, moved to safety, was going to play free. Guy gets injured, he goes to the box. That that was that's what he was. Duct tape, as Joe Judge would yeah. call him. I have a talking Seahawks question. This is a this may be a wild question, and I could see how you would say the obvious answer is no. But the Seahawks have a plethora of safeties. Do you think there's any shot that Julian Loves makes makes a move back to corner or even nickel? Because remember, he was drafted to be a nickel corner, and he kind of just never was. I mean, I nickel it, corner was such a huge question for the Giants that that was like that was you know our first ever Camp Battles podcast was like Julian Love versus Grant Haley as a nickel corner, and I even it wasn't even just fandom. Like you know, I remember Dan Duggan was like, I think Julian Love should be their nickel corner going into this year. Um, I mean, the Seahawks right now at safety, they have obviously, uh, Jamal Adams, Jamal Adams. Who, who, who else do they got there? Ben Baldwin's like a Seahawks fan. And I know he was saying how they have, like, they have a lot of safeties. Quandry Diggs, who's a solid player. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe they're trying to work some more three safety sets. Um, but I mean, they had Kobe Bryant who they liked in the nickel last year. True. Um, and Tyreek Woolen. So I, I don't know what, what exactly they're going to they're gonna do. But I, I'm actually excited to watch him, though, for them. Because it's like, okay, this is a guy who's never really had a defined position except for one year. And now he goes to a new team to see how they value him. So we yep. we, we love Julian Love. Uh, all, nothing but respect for him. And he tweeted Talking Giants First of the World, which is awkward because I two days before I said I might let him – I he might be my unpopular let walk guy. Yeah, you know, I, I have a – I have an idea that I'm not rolling out publicly yet, and Julian Love was a player that I wanted to explore possibly doing something with that idea with, and now we can't. One less player on the list. See ya, Julian Love. Giants yeah. also lost June, John Feliciano to the 49ers who signed a one-year deal. We haven't seen the money on that. Um, 
we know that Nick Gates was offered the minimum and they said we're not negotiating, like take it or leave it. Obviously got a bigger deal there. I wonder if that was the same approach with Feliciano and it's like, okay, I'm just going to go get whatever I can out there. I, I Again, I, I'd like to see the number on what he got. But the Giants are in a spot now. They have no centers on the roster. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how they attack it. Like Ben Bredesen, who was their second best offensive lineman, went healthy. We talked about this a little bit with the Dan Duggan interview before Feliciano left. Um, so just take that into note when you're listening that you don't need to tell us that Feliciano was gone. Uh, Bredesen did play center in preseason, right? Like you, you got to think the natural transition is for Ben Bredesen to play center. They want Azuda to play left guard, and I, I think that closes. It. Obviously, they're probably going to want to improve there in the draft, but yeah. there's a lot of I'm telling you, a lot of positions need to be improved on this team. A lot. Like, a lot. So don't go into these first two rounds of the draft thinking, like, we got to get this position, this position. Because there's needs. You know, and if they take a position in the first round that you think isn't one of their biggest needs, like, to take best player available, man. This team is not talented enough to not take best player available. Obviously, with some limitations. Like, don't take a tackle at pick 25. But, like, so it's... It's a but it's a huge need, and even if you want to put Ben Bredesen there, he's been very injury prone for the his first two seasons as a Giant too. Yeah, and especially if we're talking about pick twenty five, which is why I'm becoming more and more in favor of team trade back. But of course, it takes two to tango, right? You can't just you can't just especially trading back from twenty five is very different from trading back from a top 10 pick or a pick that's in the teens like the Giants had um, a couple years ago with the whole Tony trade, right? But, um, like, it, you know, people are talking about John Michael Schmitz. People are talking about Osiris Torrance and, and players like that. We'll talk about those players in the month of April. But if you're talking about first-round talents, I think the players of um, Zion Johnson and Kenny Green – are much better prospects than some of the top interior offense alignment uh, this year. So uh, it's funny that Art Stapleton went on Big Blue Kickoff and Research Rick always clips up awesome nuggets from different podcasts. And Art Stapleton went on Big Blue Kickoff and talked about how Joe Shane does give an extra bump on the draft board to certain positions of need. So while there are a lot of positions of need and the Giants may... You know, the Giants may not force a certain pick. Joe Shane does give a little bump to positions that the Giants do need in terms of how they evaluate their draft board. So I do want to keep that in mind. Yeah, so center a huge question mark now. Uh, but I, I would almost assume they're telling Ben Bredesen, just like Nick Gates in 2020, like start practicing your snaps. I, I think I'm going to work to confirm that, even though Ben Bredesen doesn't have Twitter. Um Justin, before we get into the Dan Duggan interview, why don't you talk to us about something? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll talk to you about something. Um, interior offensive line. I don't care how many guys that the Giants have under contract, Bobby. You you say this all the time. Um, interior offensive line is a spot that I think you should always be adding. Like why why not? Um, especially if you can hit on a day two guy. Um, you know maybe get some good value out of there. Um, the Chiefs, you know in a you know the Chief Creed Humphrey. Um. You know, the, Chief, the Chiefs have, have hit on guys on day two. Um, Trey Smith, remember Trey Smith? He was a day three guy that they that they hit on. So um, always be taking those interior offensive linemen. You can never have enough of them, some say. Let's talk about Manscaped before we kick it to Dan Duggan. And if you haven't already heard, the leaders in Below the Waist Grooming are traveling north of your South Pole with their revolution, revolutionary beard hedger, Pro kit. Plus, they've now launched the brand new Weed Whacker 2.0. I actually just recently used the Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer a couple days ago. Time for you to upgrade your toolbox by going to manscaped.com and using our code GIANTS for 20% off plus free shipping. The Beard Hedger, they give you a rotary wheel and that gives you 20 different hair cutting lengths all with one guard so no more messy drawers full of extra add-ons there's also a beard shampoo and conditioner there's some beard oil and to cap it off there is a beard bomb beard bomb and i've also heard rave reviews of the beard brush comb and scissors to ensure your beard is ready 
to impress. Manscaped for Performance Package 4.0, that is full body grooming. Just when you think that you can't get enough, Manscaped is giving you more to take care of yourself. So get 20% off and free shipping with our code GIANTS at manscaped.com. Always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. And we got the right beat reporter for the right job in Dan Duggan from The Athletic. All right, we now welcome on to the program of The Athletic, the one, the only, Dan Duggan. Dan, how you doing? What are we, about eight days in the free agency? Yeah, I'm doing well. First week of free agency is always a little bit of a, a blur, but they, they kind of did a good job. They gave us like one big move a day for the first couple of days and then kind of took it easy on the weekend. So it's kind of, from my perspective, I uh, appreciate how they handled that. Oh, yeah, this was very, this is one of the more clean free agencies <laughs> Where, like you said, you got like one move at a time, one at one a day. Where I remember 2021, even besides Kenny Galladay, Adore Jackson, it was just like, all right, they signed a free agent, get all your work done on him. And literally that second, they're like, all right, Reggie Ragland's a New York Giant now. Spend spend five till five, and and they were like late at night too, which is the worst. Yeah. Um, but we've we've kind of seen the the structure of free agency kind of waiting on a sean robinson news while we're recording this so if that happens it hasn't happened yet uh what are your thoughts on how joe shane has been structuring these free agent deals like obviously they didn't expect daniel jones to be back but has that him coming back and their playoff season didn't didn't expect dj back before the season and then their playoff season where they won a game has that changed this offseason a lot for them do you think Oh, I think absolutely. Um, you know, if you want to go back to when he took over, I don't think there was any plans for Daniel Jones to be here. I don't think there was really a strong plan for Saquon Barkley to be here. You can even go down to guys like Darius Slayton. I don't think we thought he'd be re-signing, you know, until pretty recently. I didn't think he was re-signing until he re-signed. Um, so, no, they've certainly uh, adapted the plan on the fly, which I think in some respects is a positive because you, know, you don't want to be stuck in your ways. You know, you want to be uh, fluid with how you view things. At the same time, there has to be at least a little bit of concern that like, okay, they won nine games and won a playoff game. Uh, how much of that was sustainable? Cause basically I think there was that stat, uh, the guy from over the cap put out how they've spent the most money in free agency. And most of that money has gone to re-signing. But obviously, you know, they're the only team who spent crazy money on a quarterback this off season. So that's going to tip the scales there. But like, you know, you're just paying Daniel Jones more money. As of now, you're paying Saquon Barkley a little more money. You're paying Darius Slayton more money. Uh, obviously they made some additions, but like, there's still some holes here. So, I mean, they're better, I would say, obviously, with uh, Okereke, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, and Waller. Um, but, there's, again, there's still plenty of holes. Obviously, they created one with uh, Julian Love's departure. So they're they're being more aggressive, for sure. Uh, even the way I think you touched on structuring deals. I, it's so funny. I just, everything Joe Shane does right now, it's like, oh, master class by Joe Shane. I mean, these are very basic structures, and they're very kind of – you know, we're backloading them because we want to try and squeeze as much into the cap. So we've, we've seen the pros and cons of that approach. I don't think they're doing anything um, too revolutionary, but I think the way he structured does speak to the fact that they're kind of going for it a little bit here. And I, I don't think that was necessarily the, the idea, 12, let alone 12 months ago, probably six months ago, um, but the way the season finished and where they're at now, they decided to kind of hit the accelerator on their plans. Between... I mean, I think Dave Gettleman is the ultimate leader, especially early on in his in his early days as GM, like the the king leader of of backloading deals and just seeing what happens, right? And then paying, you know, the Nate Solder, paying for it down the road. So if that's the scale of doing it way too much and relying on it too much versus, you know, kind of you know front loading deals and you know just you know being conservative in in that area, where do you think Joe Shane is lying on? On that scale, because really, I mean, while they are backloading deals to me, it's like, well, it's real life in the NFL that you kind of do need to backload deals as the cap grows. And as the cap goes up, I don't really view this as the Giants are going. They're going in for something, but they're not going all in. Where do you mm-hmm. agree with that? Do you just on a scale of 20, 20, 2022 to 2021, basically? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I mean, listen, I, and I don't think there's my first answer. I, I might have made it seem this way. I don't think there's anything inherently bad with backloading contracts. I think you've seen teams like who do so many cap games, like the Eagles and the Saints, and we keep saying, oh, it's going to bite them, and it really hasn't. Um, so I think there's validity to doing it that way. You could also go the the old Tampa Bay Bucks. Basically, they, you know, when they got Brady, they were doing what's called cash to cap, where it's like if you sign a $40 million contract, there's a $10 million cap at year one, year two, year three. It was just like clean as could be. 
And obviously they flipped that completely on the head once they got Brady and obviously had a Super Bowl window. Um, so I don't think there's, and again, there's pros and cons to each approach. I think the way Shane has done it though, it's funny. Cause I think, you know, I've said this a few times, we all looked at it. Like we, we got smarter, like, Oh, don't just trust those first numbers. They're always inflated. But now everyone always assumes like that's always the case. Like sometimes the real numbers are real. Like if you look at Daniel Jones's contract, yeah, there was that, that three year thing where it's 37 and a half million. The first two years though, it's 41 million and really a little bit more because he's going to hit some of those incentives unless he just gets hurt or is, you know, abysmal. Um, so that to me was, was a real $40 million a year deal. Uh, Bobby O'Karake, like he's getting 22 million over the first two years. So that's 11 million a year. Um, so like these are these aren't just like some crazy like Alvin Kamara. If you look at his contract, his last year of his um, contract, like a twenty five million dollar base salary, which obviously he will never get. But when you look at the average annual value, it's like fifteen million dollars a year. But that's that's just funny money. That's not real. Um, so that that's the the way Shane has approached it. I think is is been a, been aggressive. But I think again, if you're trying to win, you have to do it that way. Like it's great to do the just have a nice flat cap and you got out deals all the time. I don't think that's realistic. I think the thing he's done that's been pretty interesting and. Uh, not commonplace, certainly not in Giants. Move. I don't, you know, study every other team's cap practices. He's gone heavy on incentives and not just incentives, but sort of attainable incentives. A lot of times incentives are crazy things like win the Super Bowl, win MVP. But like the Daniel Jones, I mean, I know you guys have looked at it. There's super specific layers there where he can attain them. And he certainly can attain the top 15. And if he's in the top 10, like you could see that happening. And if he's in the top five, you don't care what it costs because if he's a top five quarterback, the things are going pretty well. Um, so that's that's interesting how he's he's kind of made these incentives part of the package. Uh, Paris Campbell, you know, has a pretty short money deal. He can get one point seven million dollars just by being active every week. And that's a guy with an injury history. So I understand why they put that in there. But also that's attainable for him. So I, I don't know. I've, I'm, I've been interested in the way they um, have structured these deals with that. And they've done a lot of uh, workout bonuses, which is a, a small thing. But they want guys there in April and May and June. Because how many times have you heard Brian Dable and players, you know, McKinney or some of these guys are not spoken, that the culture change started then? And one way to do that is say, hey, well, here's 50 grand, here's 200 grand uh, if you're showing up for those. So I think that's been a very uh, deliberate effort to get those into every contract just to make sure guys are there. They, like you mentioned, like with the Daniel Jones, there's a if he's even close to what they want him to be, like not Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes aspirations, like that deal's going to be over $40 million dollars. Uh, yeah. per year so yeah like I, I know i know we saw that incentives like up to what was it 195 mil but there's 70 million dollars worth of incentives and like you said a lot of those are very real i think paris campbell if he just had a very a repeat season of last year that deal would be a five million dollar deal but on a, on a one-year deal the move that nobody saw coming is the darren waller um it like how aggressive do you think that is I think it's smart. Like, I think that's one where I, I really like that move. And yeah, I'm kind of kicking myself almost in retrospect because you knew his name was out there. I mean, there was talk of him. You know, I think it's come out since. I think at the time, too, though, that the Packers are trying to trade for him. Apparently, you know, Vegas turned out a two at the time. But we knew that they were going to have to get an uh, upgrade at, uh, I'll call it like pass catcher. We, you know, you're kind of, you fix on wide receiver. And there's a lot of talk about trading for wide receivers. Uh, none of us had the foresight to see, like, maybe they'll trade for a tight end like him who, you know, we kind of should have known was available. There was even talk, like, maybe they go for some of these better tight ends rather than spending a wide receiver, even though, like, Gusecki like, got, like, no money from the Patriots and Dalton Schultz is still up there. I'm sure he's not going to sign for much. But so that was the thing. It was, like, the wide receiver free agent cost stunk. The asking price of a lot of these trades uh, seems to be too high, like, say, for the Denver guys. I never really thought, like, maybe they trade for a Waller. I will say the one trade, Brandon Cooks, like, that Cowboys trade, that was one that was kind of in my head. Like, yeah, maybe that's like a kind of compromise where you just, you know, they just dump some late round picks and the Texans even ate some of the money because they just need to get better receivers in here. Uh, but I think Waller, of all the options, is certainly the highest ceiling. I mean, you know, you look at what he did those two years in, in 19 and 20. I mean, he was basically it was Travis Kelsey and then he was right there behind him as far as a receiving tight end. None of the wide receivers available, are, you know, at their peak have been anywhere near that, you know, um, that accomplished. So, I totally, uh, I, I think it's a really good swing. You know, everything's a calculated risk. I mean, the guy is 30, coming off two injury plague seasons. I mean, he wouldn't be available for the 100th pick if he was coming off the you know, the 2020 season, obviously. Um, but the fact that they're not tied into him big time, obviously they restructured the deal, a little dead money. Listen, you don't trade for a guy expecting to cut him within a year. So you can live with that. Uh, but I think they just, you couldn't be sitting here a year from now saying, Oh man, look who Daniel Jones was throwing to. It's so hard to tell. Like, you know, you have to give him some bona fide weapons. And I, you know, I don't know that like if they got Jacoby Myers, 
I don't know if you could say, like, hey, they gave him the best they could. I feel like Darren Waller, like, this is as high end of a weapon as they could have got. You just hope he's healthy. So, so we're not sitting there saying, hey, if they only had Waller last year, who knows what Daniel Jones would have done. I think in terms of uh, the process of getting him, didn't give up a ton. Uh, you know, I really like that move. I think it's a low risk, high reward. Yeah, he's a he's a phenomenal player. Like he's the to me, he's their best player on the offense right now. Like I think he's better at his his position than Saquon is at his. Um, because I, I like you said, I think after Kelsey, he's the second best. Now you have to factor in blocking and stuff, which he's not great at. Um, do they kind of view him as wide receiver one? And like, how, how do they view that wide receiver one need? Like, are are they okay with the ragtag group they have, or do you think they're like trying to pencil in a guy for twenty five? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Joe Shane, you know, he's he's not like he kind of like reveals so like his big picture thoughts. Like, he's not quite as close to the vest as maybe some GMs. Like, he kept saying like everyone's obsessed with wide receiver one or like you know wide receiver ones. When he said that after the season, like there's a lot of wide receivers, you know, watching the you know, conference championship, whatever it was, but just felt like he's kind of protesting too much, basically saying like, I'm not going to get a wide receiver one this year. Like hopefully people understand that and just managing expectations. Um, so yeah, listen, if they, you know, they could certainly take one at 25. I still don't think you're going to pencil that guy in as your number one receiver out of the gates, but no, I, I definitely don't think anything they've done in free agency at wide receiver would preclude them from taking one as early or as often in the draft. Like a lot of these guys are one year deals slate and they can get out of it. Um, so there's still a need there long-term. And in the short term, like, I don't think you can look and say, oh, this wide receiver core is totally, you know, they fixed everything. I mean, Paris Campbell's kind of like, you look at his numbers compared to Richie James last year. It's like, okay, you upgraded there and there's a higher upside, but like, it's not uh, a dramatic difference based on what they did last year. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think that they weren't going to get a wide receiver one. I think Joe Shane was very well aware of that. I think they pivoted to like, let's get a tight, tight end slash wide receiver one in, in Darren Waller, who's again, I think he was the best pass catching option that was available. Um, but no, I think that that is still a position where, uh, they can't rest and say, Hey, we're good here. I mean, I think that 25 second round, whatever it may be, I think that's still very much on the table. Yeah. Like you said, the wide receiver room has only been slightly upgraded. Like Paris, Paris Campbell is like you said, a slight upgrade over, over Richie James with a little more ceiling on that. Darren Waller, like you said, is that huge upgrade to the room. The only reason I, I just have this feeling, obviously this from the outside looking in that, we saw in last year, I remember going to last year's draft with ended up being 11 picks and be like, there's a lot of holes on this team. Do not expect them to just plug every position that they need help at. And then they did that. They basically like every <laughs> position that was of dire need, they went safety, tight end, linebackers, like every, every position they went and plugged, like plugged holes and, and almost drafted for need where I kind of, I, I worry slash think that they might be just like, all right, we got to get our wide receiver at 25, kind of like. Kind of like they did uh, with Gettleman and Judge in 2020 with getting Tony, where it's like, ah, we didn't get Devontae Smith. Let's trade back and get the next best guy on our list. Yeah, well, I mean, the line I used last year, you know, thankfully for the Giants' sake, it's a little less applicable. Is like they had so many, so many needs. You could just, you know, take best available, and you're still going to hit a need. Uh, they're not necessarily in that boat, but like you said, you, you took off some of the positions there, like cornerback. Like they haven't even, you haven't even heard them attached to a guy. And that, that's a, I think it's a pretty significant need. Um, so that's a spot I think definitely could be in the running for, for the first round pick. So a wide receiver or corner, probably the two, um, you know, priority posi- premium positions that could be in play there. But, you know, you probably can rule out like a tight end in the first round. You probably rule out a running back, probably rule out inside linebacker, uh, try the offensive tackle. Pretty much anything else I would say is on the board. And you're still saying, you know, you're, you're certainly addressing a need, but, uh, there's a wide range there of needs they can fit. So I think they can be able to find, match those two things up. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that to me, cornerback sticks out. I mean, I even, you know, I've looked at like Dane Brugler's mock drafts and stuff, and it seems like there's cornerbacks in that uh, range and it seems like there's wide receivers in that range. So uh, I think either would probably be the the kind of favorite if I was setting odds right now where they go with that pick. I want to go back to Waller for, for a quick sec, because as – as the week went on last week and as the move fully kind of set in, I'm like, you know, really sitting there being like, this is this is a big deal. Uh, this is a big deal for Daniel Jones, like besides Saquon Barkley, but even, you know, not even counting Saquon Barkley, like this is the best receiving weapon that Daniel Jones has had in, throughout his career so far. So what is the role you envision for Darren Waller? Not necessarily schematic wise, but is this, you mentioned like, you know, is this the number one target move that Joe Shane made this offseason without costing us wide receiver one assets 
And here's the main thing. Will he be relied upon like a number one target, getting 100, 110, maybe even creeping up towards 120 targets? Because that's a lot of targets, and I don't know if there's been a singular receiver that's, that Daniel Jones has thrown to his career that's gotten like 100-plus, 110-plus targets. Yeah, no, I mean, I would think so. I mean, I, cause again, you just kind of look at what else is there. I mean, obviously, you want to have a balanced offense, isn't that? Um, but it's, you know, you don't have to look too far to this coaching staff's background. Obviously, Mike Kafka spent a lot of time in Kansas City. We saw how they featured a tight end. Brian Dable was the tight ends coach in New England when when Gronk was uh, in his prime. So they know how to feature a tight end. Now, uh, you're going to want to – they're going to do, you know, all the stuff they do. They're going to move guys around. They're going to have a lot of that, you know, quick passing in to get the ball into some of these guys' hands and, and that type of thing. But I would think uh, Darren Waller is going to be, you know, when you're getting making out the game plan, it's going to be how we're going to kind of feed this guy first and foremost. And I also would think, um, you know, Daniel Jones is back in the pocket. He's probably going to trust him. Uh, you know, more than some of these other guys too. You can, uh, you know, it's funny. We talk, it's like some of these things sound like Kenny Galladay, where it's like, I don't, you know, he put it up for grabs for him, something like that. But I just think Waller is um, certainly a more dynamic player. So you hope he'd be open more often than Kenny Galladay was. But I would think he should um, be that number one kind of safety valve for Jones. And I certainly think that would be the plan going in here. I mean, if he's getting like out targeted by Darius Slayton or Isaiah Hodgins, I feel like something either went wrong or Darren Waller probably got injured. So I think going in, a healthy down wall, I think, certainly be uh, their clear cut number one. Quick trivia: Who, what receiver or tight end had the most targets uh, in a Daniel Jones season with one hundred nine? And what year? Oh, one hundred nine. One hundred and nine targets. Oof. I think of someone who stayed healthy. Was it Golden Tate in uh, twenty nineteen? That's a good guess, um, but it's Evan Ingram, two thousand twenty. Yeah, I was gonna say there was a year, oh. there was a year where Engram stayed healthy and made the Pro Bowl. <laughs> oh yeah, wow, I, that's a good one. Here, I, I want to ask you this because you're not a fan. Obviously, you're a reporter. Does it aggravate you as much as me that this idea that Evan Ingram's totally revamped his career and is like, oh, he never did anything of this on the Giants when he's having like his third best year in yards per game, <laughs> and he's he's simply like he's not being targeted down the field. He's simply just almost become like a gadget tight end for them because it drives me nuts every time. It's like, look what Evan Ingram did outside. It's like he's he's done that before. Twenty nineteen, he was actually a good player. But anyways, uh, oh, I think the thing is, he was the the poster boy for change of scenery was doing well. So even that, the reputation kind of going with it, where like maybe he didn't produce better, but I don't know. I didn't, you know, watching every game, he might have the same amount of drops or tipped into interceptions, something like that. You just don't, you don't hear about, you don't see about when guys in Jacksonville. And he did have some, he had some monster games in the second half of the season too. So I think that kind of like formed people's opinions of the fresher thing. Like when he kind of went off there in like a four game stretch. Yeah. He was best on primetime TV is, is I think what it was. <laughs> and the, and the Jags were good and fun. So obviously that, that brings, that raises all boats. Um, we're recording be- this before any possible Ashawn Robinson news. Wait, before you ask that, Bob, I want I have one more question on the offense, and then we'll then we'll switch to other stuff and like skill position stuff. Um, speaking of being a reporter, not being a fan, because every every offensive move that Joe Shane has made so far, Dan, I feel like the line has been up. Oh, there's little risk here. There's little risk here. There's little risk here. They're making a lot of moves that have little risk financially. And especially like from a value standpoint, there's like there's little risk and value. But the biggest risk they're running, at least in my opinion, is is the possibility of just being low on depth again, kind of like they were this year, if the injuries start to pile up like they did last year. So what's your take on the giant skill position players as of right now? And, how, and, you know, obviously they'll add to it through the draft, but it's not even a question. It's just a concern of me as a fan of the Giants could be in the same position that they were last year if they have some injuries kind of pile up and even though these are low risk ads that they're having they could find themselves in a similar spot as they were in last year no i I see what you're saying it's almost like you add up so many quote-unquote low risk high reward guys well if all the risks are realized all of a sudden it becomes a big risk because you know paris campbell was cheap because the guy couldn't stay healthy in indianapolis darren waller was available because he couldn't stay healthy uh you know obviously like it was funny when people freaked out about Sterling Shepard come back. I mean, it's like the minimum of minimum deals. I don't even think they're counting on him. I look at Shep really as like Wandell Robinson insurance. If, you know, I don't think Wandell, I mean, he said he will be, but we'll see. I don't think he'll be ready for week one. And if he's not, you have a guy who uh, is, you know, been super productive, great report, Daniel Jones, obviously great for the vibes, but you, you don't, you know, you're hoping he's there for four to six weeks and then Wandell comes back and, and supplants him. And, it, you know, if, if it even shakes out that way, 
Um, but no, I, I hear what you're saying that like we all, this is the time of year where you look at best case scenarios. I think if you're a fan, it's like, well, Hey, we got the guy who got, you know, 1200 yards receiving. It's like, well, that was, you know, going on three years ago now. So it, it's, it is certainly, um, you know, if you look at a half class empty, you can say you also you getting the guy who missed, you know, however many games the last two years. Um, so no, I think that's valid. Um, it's hard. Like it's hard to really build up the depth. I mean, you're going to just make a lot of like Jeff Smith signings or, you know, cause again, like Richie James last year, when he signed nobody, we were, we were sitting here on this podcast talking about Richie James and he turned out to be a really valuable depth piece. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, we, we're not going to react to those guys now. And then obviously, you know, you come across Isaiah Hodgins off the waiver wire and, you know, mid season. So like, those are the moves that are kind of, you know, depth is kind of hard. You know, it's like, if you talk about defensive line, that's where Bobby was going next. Like it seems like they're really targeting that with like legitimate NFL guys. Um, to build out that depth up. But a lot of the other positions, you're just taking cheap flyers, you're going to get some draft picks, and you just hope that if some of these injuries do strike, that you have some depth built in. We've got about a two-year window with Isaiah Hodgins come breaking out to like boost guys up like Jeff Smith. Like, no one knew <laughs> Isaiah. Like, Je- like, that guy can become a player. Oh, totally. With Leonard, with a Sean, I don't want to talk about defensive line, but is there any chance Leonard Williams is not here? Because that, to me, it doesn't make any sense for him to not be on the Giants. Uh, yeah, a chance. Yeah, I, I think there's a chance. I mean, I, I look at it. It's like usually when you're in these situations, there's kind of like two options. Like, like say James Bradbury last year, they were either going to cut him or trade him. Like there was, n- you know, people could t- fantasize about other things. They weren't going to do any of those two. I think with Leonard Williams is like five legitimate options. And I think there's pros and cons to all of them. You know, some more likely than others. Like, I think the least likely option is they just like leave his cap hit alone. He plays out the season and then they move on. The season. I don't think that'll happen. The other four, and I don't think they'll trade him. I don't think he's going to take that contract. I don't want to see that happening. The other four, I think, are all pretty realistic. You do a restructure where they push the money into the void year that's already on his contract. That's kind of goes with the all-in type mode where it's like, listen, you know, Joe DeShane does not want to uh, push money into the future, but sometimes you kind of have to do that if you, if you want to win and you've already made some, some moves to win now. You could extend him, which to me, that's like the – if you can thread that needle, that's the best avenue to take because – you keep him on the team, you lower his cap hit significantly. And the problem for the team there is you're investing in a guy who's getting a little older, obviously started to finally show a little cracks in the durability last year. You have to determine if that was an aberration or a sign that he's breaking down because he does have a lot of miles on him. But I still think that's probably the best option. You get a reasonable contract. And that, again, that's why it's a needle to have to thread. Um, pay cut, I think, is probably the ideal option from the team's perspective. The way I look at a pay cut is he's got an $18 million salary. Yeah, you're not going – yeah, and you're not going to him for a $2 million pay cut. That doesn't even, it wouldn't even be worth your time. You, you have to go for like four to six million to, again, to even make that phone call worthwhile for Joe Shane. That's a big ask. And if I'm, if I'm Leonard Williams, I'm saying, okay, if I can give up $6 million, make 12 this year, or I can go hit the market and listen, maybe he's not going to get $12 million a year, but he can sign a multi year deal. He's going to get more than that guaranteed. And, and listen, he might even get more than that. You know, we don't know how the rest of the league views him. He's been a really productive player. So that one, I think, is. I'm sure in Joe Shane, you know, that's why he keeps joking, like thanking the media for asking that, you know, Leonard Williams that question on uh, on exit day. Uh, and then the other option is what I do there. Oh, just cutting him. And then that saves you $12 million. I mean, that's, that's the other option, which I think, think it would be a bad option because you're talking about building depth and all these different things. To take away one of your best players kind of sets you back. And, I, and I, I'm not a believer in, oh, you take his $12 million and, you know, we go sign three nachos. Your defense line isn't better. You know, maybe you can – scrape by like that but i think there is a a value in really good players and so if they were to cut him and just try and patch it together i i I don't think that would work out i think we're heading for a void year because even though saquon talked about him not trying to reset the market and injury history and larry williams sending a pay cut larry williams has put the giants over a barrel and i'm (laughs) sure his agent isn't going to give some extension without it being big money and are the giants willing to give him some big money but also i don't see any value in cutting him and I didn't even put context on the Leonard Williams thing. I mean, he got asked that in an interview. And I think one of my pet peeves is how people are so imprecise with like language. Like everything is called a restructure. And it's like a restructure is what Darren Waller did, where they just take some of your salary, convert it into a bonus, and it has absolutely no impact on the player. Um, like a pay cut is where you lose money. And then, you know, maybe they could give it the thing I think they would do is try to say, hey, we're going to cut your pay by, let's say, $4 million. But if you do this, this, and this, you can make six million back. You know that that way you kind of at least give them a little carrot. Um, and, then, and it's funny because I think the word pay cut has been replaced by rework. When you see like the national report, they so and so reworked this contract by like seven million. It's like you got you know, salary got slashed by seven million. 
Um, but so he got asked about taking a pay cut and he kind of just like said, Hey, I consider it. But then I don't know if it was within the same answer or maybe someone circled back on that same session. He totally walked it back. He's like, well, I haven't really given that much of a thought. I, you know, it didn't come up in my exit interview. Uh, I'd have to talk to my agent, blah, blah, blah. So like, it wasn't like he was like, yeah, you know what? Like, I, whatever it takes, I'm going to be here. Just, you know, $5 million, no problem. Like, he, <laughs> he didn't really say it with his chest. He kind of like, yeah, you know, I'd consider it. But when push comes to shove, I mean, as you said, his agents have done a very good job of maximizing his earnings. If I'm them, I mean, he might like it here. Maybe that maybe that's the, the tiebreaker. But, like, if it's a $6 million pay cut, I'm saying, Leonard, we can go on the market and get a lot more than $12 million. So that that, to me, would be a tough sell. We're a few weeks out from the combine, and I remember last year, you know, there was Logan Ryan make a cut, Logan Ryan make a cut, and, Le and Leonard Williams being cut reminded me of like, oh, that's a move mm -hmm. that I wouldn't agree with, number one, and also I, I don't, you know, we don't, ex I, I'm not expecting Leonard Williams to get cut, but maybe, but maybe it could happen. Um, is there anything that was stemming from the combine this year that maybe you heard, but you're like, oh, I don't think that's, I, I don't think that's going to happen, but I heard it maybe a few times. Is there anything funky that was coming out of the combine this year that's maybe on the horizon for the Giants? That's a good question. I mean, because, yeah, Leonard Williams, I mean, uh, the Logan Ryan one uh, definitely does stick out. I think Pat Leonard reported like a week or two before the combine. And it was kind of like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Not his report, but just like financially it didn't make any sense. And then I was talking to people at the combine and they were kind of like, oh, no, I wouldn't dismiss that. Um, and obviously it came to be. There's nothing like that that jumps out to me. Because, I mean, listen, to be honest, so much of that combine was Daniel Jones and Saquon. Like, those two topics dominated everything, too. So it was like, you know, when you're quarterback, like, literally one night I went to um, a hotel lobby bar and Kevin Abrams and Brian Murphy, Daniel Jones' agent, were sitting at the same high-top table, you know, before, I guess before they went up to dinner. And it was just So it's like you knew that they were very much engaged in conversations. Um, so that was dominating all the gossip or all the reporting you're trying to do. is like, what is going on with this? Uh, obviously, national reporters were all over it, too. So, like, that was a, such a dominant topic that – I don't really recall or nothing jumps out to me as something like sort of under the radar, like the Leonard Williams thing. I didn't, I never got any great intel on that, but I think it was probably just more focused on, um, on the big move. It was interesting to hear how involved Kevin Abrams is slash was in that Daniel Jones negotiation. Cause really that's the first time that we've heard his name since he got kind of his demotion from <laughs> assistant GM kind of when Joe Shane came in. Yeah. I mean, he's in a very uh, like niche role, like, I mean, he's a skilled negotiator. Like people can say, oh, their cap or the contract and stuff like that. But like negotiating is still a skill. And he's done it for like 25 years as a kind of like the lead negotiator. So I don't know exactly. Uh, this is probably something I need to do a better job reporting out. Like when they were sitting at the table, let's say in the Giants facility, like is Joe Shane kind of running the show or is Kevin Avery running the show? I don't know that. But I do know Kevin Avery was much more like the point man. Like he's the one dealing with the eight. Because Joe Shane has a million things on his plate. He can't spend eight hours you know, getting drinks, going to dinner, all this stuff. Like, he has so much on his plate. He's got to do interviews with prospects. So you need a kind of a lieutenant like Kevin Abrams to, to at least do that. I mean, because, again, some of that stuff was so complex with the structure and the incentives and all that stuff. Like, you need to have someone like Kevin Abrams to at least, you know, be dealing with that very minute stuff, and then you bring it to, to Joe Shane. But, yeah, that is – he's definitely very much still involved in that. Um but, you know, I think Joe Shane is, is more involved than at least Dave Gettleman. And to my, uh, to my knowledge, Jerry Reese, like he is more hands-on from what I gather in that stuff. But I do think uh, Kevin Abrams and then Ed Triggs uh, also are, are still very much um, involved in that. Because, I mean, listen, that's their area of expertise. Joe Shane, um, I think, understands the cap, obviously. But I don't think, you know, he's an expert like those two guys are in terms of just they live it every day. You mentioned Saquon being a big talk down there. And I feel like it's kind of gotten forgotten in the Daniel Jones contract and, and free agency. He's on the tag. He's able to negotiate with teams, obviously, if they wanted to like, do some type of sign-in trade or something. I, I don't see that happening. Uh, where is this headed? Does Saquon play on the franchise tag? One, do they want him to play on the franchise tag? And the reported offers, if that's still there, how has Saquon not accepted it yet? <laughs> no, it's it's fascinating. I, yeah, I remember some of the other reporters, like, as soon as he got tagged and Jones and Simon were like, oh, this will get done. Um and I was kind of like, oh, I, I mean, I really hadn't heard one way or the other. I was kind of surprised that people just thought it was like this, uh, you know, they'll be done. But I, I, when you look at it objectively, it makes sense because if those offers, like you mentioned, like let's just say $13 million a year, that was still on the table, you know, going into last week. Like, I'm not sure if you're him what you're kind of holding out for. Like, there's absolutely no incentive for the Giants to up their offer. If anything, that's, that's generous at this point because, I mean, you look at that, wire, that running back market, nobody's getting paid. Uh, so, 
I don't know. I mean, it, they're an interesting spot. If I'm the Giants, and I'm not saying this is what they think, I'm totally fine with playing him on the tag. That's if any position you want to go year to year with, it's that one, especially a guy who, yeah, he had a bounce back year last year. Who's to say he's going to you know, duplicate that? Because I'm them. I tag him this year. Uh, you let him play on the tag this year. That's a good year. I tag him again. You still only, you know, out $22 million in that scenario. Still, uh, you're coming out ahead of what the average annual value is on these longer term deals. So if I'm him, I'm curious to see how he's going to play this because what what's his play? Like, I'm going to sit out OTAs and kind of be a distraction. Like, is that enough to, 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 I don't know, get ownership involved and say, listen, give him 14. Like, what's the number that is even, he's not going to get, you know, 16 million dollars a year, obviously at this point. Like, how can he squeeze any more out of him? So, I, again, if I'm him and I'm not, and I have three years, $39 million, yeah, I think you have to swallow your pride and just take it unless you're willing to say, screw it, I'm going to play on the tag. And then, but again, he can tag again. I don't know. I don't know what his end game would be uh, if he doesn't take these offers, assuming they stand. And I still I haven't heard otherwise. I assume they do still stand. That'd be kind of, you know, it'd be a ruthless move, a little bit dirty, dirty pool, though, especially if they're pretty well publicized what they put out there. Um, so unless he just thinks him being disgruntled is enough of a thing uh, to move the needle and, and force their hand to off their offer, I, I can't see that being the case, though. Yeah, it's fascinating from every angle where it's like, I don't think he's a guy with the, not just running back position in general. Like I hate when there's generalities made about the running back position, but Saquon Barkley in particular with his injury history and his ability and not just a history of injuries, but a history of not playing well when dealing with like little bang ups, you know, not major injuries, missing games that one, they offered him supposedly some long-term deal. Maybe that could be a lot of fake money in it. And then for right. his point of view to not take that and to be willing to do this tag thing, which I think is from the Giants point of view, that would be the ideal situation is playing him on the tag. So I, yeah. I have and no idea how this him. plays out, but it's fascinating. Like he said, like he didn't want to be on the tag. So I can't imagine that it change. It's, it's just objectively, it's not a good outcome for him. You're making $10 million a year. If you have a bad year, you get banged up. Then you're, what's your market like next off season if the Giants want to move on? So to, to me, that's, I mean, the only other, I can't, wouldn't even call this leverage, but like they'll save a few million on the cap if they extend him, presumably, you know, as we talked earlier, you can kind of backload these deals. So maybe he's waiting for them to like come back to him and say, listen, we need like 4 million on the cap. Let's get this deal done. And he says, fine, but throw in an extra, you know, 500 grand a year. I don't know. Like, I just think he has zero leverage. If Miles Sanders went out and got like $12 million a year, then you can say, look at the running back market is, you know, is bountiful. Let's, let's, you know, I'm better than this guy. Miles Sanders got like six. So it's just, I just don't see him having any leverage. And again, if I was advising him, I'd say, listen, man, it stinks. We thought we were going to get more. It's still a pretty good offer. It's where you want to be. He definitely wants to be in New York, kind of swallow hard and, and take it. But uh, it's easier said than done, I guess, if you had your sights set on one thing and you feel like you're getting underpaid by an organization that you probably feel like should value more, I can understand the human element to that to an extent. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the, really the only leverage he has would be to not show up the training camp, which yeah, is like, is, is a guy like Saquon Barkley going to not show up the training camp? That's the question. So, right. like, even OTAs and minicamp, him not being there, I don't think it even moves the needle for, I like, I don't, I don't see Giants fans even being mad at Saquon for not showing up to minicamp and OTAs. And, like, we should be, mad, you know, that's something that, oh, yeah, just being overblown. accepted. Like, yeah, no, no, that, but again, like, and then he's a very image conscious guy. Like, he would lose the fan base if, if he's, if, you know, Everyone kind of knows what these offers are too. And if he just like hold, no, it wouldn't be a hold up, but he just skips training camp out of, you know, um, his anger about, you know, kind of being mistreated by the Giants. He's not going to get a lot of sympathy. He's a very, you know, he's a very marketable guy and brand conscious guy. So I don't think he has a lot of great options. And then I'm sure the Giants feel that way too, which is probably why they're just, you know, whenever you're ready to come sign that contract, big guy, because I, I just can't see why they would give him a penny more than what they've offered. And honestly, you could justify, you know, giving less. I, I don't think they'll do that either. So there's a curse right now of tw players that have tweeted talking Giants versus the world uh, <laughs> being done. Nick Gates gone. Julian Love gone. Chris Myrick, they just traded for Darren Waller, which makes his job less less uh, secure. But with the Nick Gates part, what is the – what's happening at center? Like are, are they kind of like got their offer out for Feliciano and they're expecting them to come back? Like are they willing to put a guy like Bredesen there because they like Azudu? Like what? Do you, what is your feel on the center spot? Because it's, it's right now. It's a huge. Like they don't even have anyone that plays center on the roster, really. Yeah. No. I'll be honest. I'm a little surprised that Feliciano isn't back on some you know one year, two and a half, three million dollar deal. Um, can't, I mean, I can't imagine he thinks he's got some super strong market elsewhere. 
Uh, I think he's more valuable to, I wouldn't even say the Giants, more valuable to like Bobby Johnson, Brian Dable, and Joe Shane than he is anywhere else. So I would still think that's how that plays out. Again, I mean, he's not a guy that they're going to want to spend a lot of money. I, I can't imagine he's can be deluded to thinking he has a, you know, a big market out there and now we're a week in, he hasn't signed. So I would think they bring him back to me. He kind of feels like an ideal stopgap type guy where you can draft a center not feel compelled to start that guy as a rookie, but yeah. then, you know, next year, you know, again, please don't definitely be a one-year deal. Okay. This guy's, you know, apprenticed for a year. He's ready to take over. But if for whatever reason um, they don't bring him back, I think Bredesen is, is certainly one of those guys in the mix. I think, I think the goal and the plan is for Zuda to start left guard. I mean, you drafted him 67th overall, you know, there was definitely some, some highs and lows last year, but you draft the guy uh, at that point, you have to expect, that he's going to develop into a starter in year two. I don't think that's unreasonable. I think you probably saw enough to make. And, and if he doesn't, they have other options too. I mean, Joe Shank keeps talking about how they have like 15 guards basically under contract. Um, but so then center, I think you have a, a mixture of like Bredesen, Shane Lemieux, Jack Anderson. Like none of those guys are going to get you excited. But like, again, it's sort of like a strength in numbers thing where you let those guys battle it out. I'd probably put Bredesen uh, as the top option. I remember talking, I think it was talking to Pat Flaherty after last season. And, you know, that was a thing they had discussed. I think he'd taken a few snaps here and there. Like, they think that could be his home. Um, so that's the new coaching staff, and it feels like um, they view it that way too. So maybe that's a way to get a guy like him on the field who has, you know, been pretty solid at guard. But, you know, centers are less valuable than guards. You can kind of maybe get by with a cheap guy. Maybe maybe that's the route they go. I still still think Feliciano will be back, but uh, I'm not sure quite what the hangup is there. Yeah, Bredesen's one of the more intriguing players on the roster because – I mean, he when he played, he was their second best offensive lineman. Uh, but again, like he did the year before, where he was bad, the injuries, and then, like you said, Azudu. Azudu showed signs of improvement. He wasn't out there being a world beater, but did show signs of improvement for a guy who needed it, but has that athletic profile. So it's like, do they put him at center? Like, is he gonna be a backup after performing better than guys like Lewinsky who have bigger contracts? So, Justin, do you have anything else? I have nothing else. Thank you, uh, Dan Duggan. Some say you're an award-winning uh, journalist. <laughs> yeah, what do you think yeah. we should do with the Tony Award? Because I'm kind of like a little burnt out on it. No, here's but... here's a different question. Here's the thing: is I don't like the fan vote. But here, here's here's a different question though. What what do the other be, at least some of you know the beat reporters that we're close with and stuff like that? Do you have an idea of what they think about it? And do you guys view it as like an award that you're proud of? Or is it just a joke? I'm certainly proud of my uh, my trophy. And also, didn't Jordan like campaign for it and was like kind of butthurt that he didn't get it? So that alone makes – I want him to come – want to do it again just so he can't win so he can be upset about it again. Because wasn't that the case? He was, you guys did some sort of thing on Twitter where you were like – you know, saying why well, he blew his candidacy somehow. I, well, I Danny King broke the that. news that Nick Gates and Ben Bredesen would be rotating. On Saturday okay. night, uh, Danny King, King of Scoops. Um, and Jordan tweeted that out the next day and didn't credit Danny King. So I think uh, I think he lost probably about 20 votes or so, and that ended up mattering. Okay. Um, we thought about doing like it because it's it's not about being a good person. It's about being the best beat reporter, about doing like a point system of you get a scoop on a free agent signing type of thing. You get it, you know, it. But that's just too much work for us to keep up yeah, with. Yeah, that everyone's. feels like a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> if it did, if hey, if it did happen, Ryan Dunleavy would be like number one right now. He's been yeah, he's killing it this offseason. I I mean, I've never. That's the most I've ever seen a beat reporter go to war with the with Giants fans on Twitter, and then getting the Daniel Jones news. I'm sure felt like some pretty good vindication for him. Yeah, when you get him, I told you, you got to get him on. I mean, he would be he'd be a riveting interview for a lot of reasons, but to the take you inside that like three week phase he had there where he, like you said he was going to war and then he gets the scoop. Like, I mean, that was, he had a, he had a run there for himself. Yeah. I think we're going to get him on at some point, you know, once, once the draft's over is when we kind of move into more interview based stuff. But yeah, he was, okay. I, I mean, I had, I've been, I've been paying attention to this since 2019 really. And I've never seen a beat reporter just wage a two week war with just like, <laughs> just trying to destroy narratives where it's like Dunleavy, you got to give it up, man. Like the, the they're fans, like they're they're gonna they're gonna defend their guy. <laughs> He's Dan, entertaining, Dan. We appreciate you. Uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks again for uh, coming on. Everyone, go subscribe to the Athletic. All right, thanks a lot, guys. All right, thanks, Dan Duggan, for coming on the podcast. In today's episode, today's podcast is sponsored by SeatGeek. 
That's right, geeks. Get some seats. Baseball is back, and to celebrate, SeatGeek is giving a special offer to our fans. Use code John Boy Preseason. This is different than our usual code. John Boy Preseason for fifteen percent off your order, whether you are a first time buyer or not. That's huge because a lot of times, it's, you know, it's first time code off. This is like if you've used Seek ten million times, you can get fifteen percent off with John Boy Preseason. If you don't know what SeatGeek is, they're a ticketing app that makes buying tickets super simple. SeatGeek puts tickets from all over the web into one place to make buying simple and rates every ticket from 0 to 10 to make sure you're getting a good deal. Green good, red bad. Simple as that. The code uh, works on tickets to anything and does not matter how many times you've bought tickets using SeatGeek before. So again, you don't have to use this on baseball even though this ad is about baseball. So John Boy Preseason is going to get you 15% your uh, next order. And again, this this offer ex- expires at the end of the month. So draft month rolls around, this uh, this promotion is done. So go use John Boy Preseason. Use it for hockey games. The Devils are awesome. Uh, we've got the hookup for you right now. Use code John Boy Preseason for 15% off tickets at SeatGeek. All right, Justin. Thanks again, Dan Duggan, coming on the pod. Uh, we'll be back on Friday. Probably a two or three signings podcast, but if not, we'll we got to get a mailbag in uh, within the next two episodes, and then we have Nick Filato on for our annual uh, uh, mid mid round prospects, and then it's then it's draft month. We put together our draft month schedule, got the production get going for the draft hoodie. It's right around the corner. What was it thirty nine days? Something like that. It's insane. It's insane how fast it's coming around. Doesn't doesn't feel like it. Um, what what do we think night one's gonna be like? Like we we've always, all right, like we we think it's a long time of waiting until pick five. We have pick twenty five. I mean twenty twenty one. We wait. I'd basically wait till pick twenty, but we were on the clock and not. Oh, but right. But there was the excitement of the trade though. So things were happening in Giants land despite us not picking until pick twenty. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, it'll be. It'll be. What if? Imagine if you're like a team that like trades your first round pick for a wide receiver, and it's like, oh, we get, we get a guy that everyone like. Imagine Cardinals fans just like, all right, first round recap. We traded for Hollywood Brown. <laughs> well, imagine being a Rams fan every year. Yeah, they didn't have any picks to the fourth round. That it's so weird. That's why I said the Rams last year should have just traded away those picks for whatever they could have gotten, and been like. Take the year off, scouts. Like, get some much needed rest and relaxation. Like, uh, enjoy yourself. Get a little, get, get working on 2023. But they didn't listen to me. There was a, uh, there was a tweet recently that was going around of every NFL team was at Oregon's pro day besides the Rams. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys got to figure it out, man. They just don't have picks. They should just trade. They should trade like everybody away, but they're not. They're well, not. They're letting going everyone to. go, basically. Yeah, and trading them away. So they're they're in full rebuild mode. So we appreciate you guys. We'll see you on Friday. Until then, let's go big blue. <laughs>